the slides are not going to just be in the sequence there in the book. But what I want to suggest you do is you listen real carefully. Pay attention. It doesn't matter if you go in sequence in the book. What matters is do you understand and are you going to apply it? That's the key. So let's look at this. Here's what we want to do. We've got to understand that there's a power flowing to and through us constantly. It never stops. It'll be flowing to and through you when you're not even in that body anymore. So this is constant. And while we're in this life, we want to learn to control the flow of it. Let it flow freely. If you're not relaxed, you're not effective. You've got to be relaxed. It'll improve everything that you connect with. Now look it. This is really you. Think of yourself, pardon me, think of yourself as a mass of energy. You are a mass of energy. And if this mass of energy is in a negative vibration, I'm going to tell you, you affect everything you come in contact with in a negative way. You know someone who gets into a negative vibration fairly often. And you don't enjoy being around that person. You really don't enjoy being around them. And why don't you enjoy it? Because you're in a negative vibration. It's just not fun. It's not good to be around them. You're picking up bad energy from them, and you don't like it. Now, here's the point. I think some of these people know what they're doing. I really think they know it. But they've never developed the discipline or the strength to change it. They know they don't feel good. They know they're not particularly happy. They know they're letting this and that and everything under the sun affect them. They got to get a light. They got to smarten up. They got to wake up. You see, that, you know, that's why I was so impressed on that set. When I was on the set with the ravine, I was, I keep talking about it. I was so impressed. Everybody moved in such an orderly way. It was absolutely beautiful to watch. Didn't matter what their job was, they were all moving and doing it. I never saw anybody upset about anything. And there was a lot of people there. And there was a lot of things happening at the same time. One person barked out an order, everybody'd move and it would all be done. Would you, would you agree? There was no confusion. They were controlling the flow of the energy in them. They weren't trying to control the flow and the energy in somebody else. If we, you know, there's an old Dutch proverb, if everybody sweeps in front of their own front door, the whole town will be clean. Pretty good advice, isn't it? All we have to do is just really work on ourselves. Stay in a reasonably good mood. I mean, what the hell? Nobody wants to be around us if we're not in a good mood. Now look it. Everything's energy, or everything's spirit, call it whichever way you want. Everything vibrates. A frequency is a level of vibration. You operate on frequencies. You operate exactly the same as your phone. You're operating on a frequency. A frequency is a level of vibration, and there's an infinite number of them. There's no end to them. It's infinite, and they're all hooked together. We are all hooked together. That is why if you're in a bad vibration and you're near someone, they're going to feel it. What is feeling? Conscious awareness of vibration. They're picking up that energy. Now, by the same token, when you're in a good vibration, they pick up that energy. Now, here's the beautiful truth. 
whatever energy you send out, the universe gives it right back simultaneously with you sending it out. You see, you're activating brain cells, you're sending off a vibration. But as you activate the brain cells to send the vibration off, your brain is taking on an equal amount of like energy simultaneously with sending it out. So it's just like you're just a sieve that is flowing through. Now, we know this, even if you were never saw this before yesterday, we did cover this yesterday. And here, Einstein was a pretty bright guy. He said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift. It's a sacred gift. No other form of life, so far as we know, has this gift. The rational mind is a faithful servant. We've created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. I give you a test. Over the next week, make up your mind. Every now and then, you'll say to a person, do you know what our higher faculties are? Do you know what the higher faculties of our mind are? And they'll look at you with a What do you mean? Well, I don't know. What are they? The average person has no concept of it. We have been trained since we were infants to live by what we hear, see, smell, taste, touch. And we don't go beyond that. If you're afraid of the dog, the dog will bite you. If you're afraid of the horse, the horse isn't going to treat you really well. Do you know why? Animals operate by instinct, which is perfect. They pick up vibration. They feel your energy. They say, well, that dog doesn't know. Oh, yes, the dog knows. The dog picks it up. Super sensitive. Now think, really think about this. Whatever energy you're sending out, we want to start studying each one of these faculties. Because there's what's going to make you your life. It's by using these higher faculties that we can adjust, adapt, adopt, we can do anything. Now, remember I said that's where you are. That's where you are. And if you're real honest and take a look at where you are in your life, you can see how you got there. You can look back, and you can look back over your life, and you'll see how as you become more aware, you moved ahead. And you moved ahead in life until you got to where you're at. That X represents where you're at. It represents where I'm at. We can all play the same game here. And we can look back over our life. I can go right back to the time I was a little kid. And so can you. Or you can look back at last week. Or maybe 10 years ago. You, have, you can look back and you can take a look at the things that were happening in your life. The people that you mixed with. And you'll say, that's where I am, but that is where I want to go. Now, this just may be idle dreaming that that comes to your mind, and then, of course, it fades. But every now and then, we bring it back. And then it fades. And then we bring, maybe not the same thing back, but something equal is nice or, you know, you're stretching your mind. But with most people, it never enters their mind. They can actually go there. They can be that, do that, have that. Yet, it's just a daydream. Why do they let it go like that? Because they don't know any better. They're, prop they're ignorant. They don't know. What we want to really grasp is it silly to let the dream go? What we want to do is step right into it because there is a place. When you sit down in an idle state, you just let your mind wander, you're going to a place. Nothing is created or destroyed. Everything's already here. The lifestyle that we enjoy now, these would be considered the golden years by uh, some of our ancestors. 
The way we're living now is way beyond where your grandparents ever thought we would be. Way beyond it. Just your grandparents. Forget your great-great-grandparents. Yet isn't that long ago that we didn't have cars. Forget the planes. And when anybody talked about a car when they first come out, don't buy one of those, that's stupid. You'd have to stop and put gas in. There's no gas stations. There's no roads to run on. They're all dirt roads. I mean, forget it. Never entered their mind that we would have super highways and all kinds of gas stations. And then we're building them now with no gas. That, that was way beyond people's thinking. See, the average individual, when a beautiful picture of how they can live comes to their mind, it's rejected almost instantaneously. It fades. Well, we want to know that that's a place. And the moment your belief, you've got to believe it, and you'll believe your belief through your evaluation, your belief systems based upon your evaluation of something. And if you frequently reevaluate your belief about it will change, whatever it is. But the moment your belief matches with any state, that's a state. The moment your belief matches with any state, you fuse with it, you become one with it. We're not talking about the body, we're talking about the consciousness. You, be, you fuse with it. This union results in the activation, projection, of its plots, plans, and conditions, and circumstances. See, when you do that, you affect the entire universe. Now, that is just not but a gross exaggeration to most people. They say, that's silly, that couldn't possibly happen. Of course it can. It is, it does, it will. Now think, this new state, when you're operating with the proper consciousness, this new state of awareness becomes your home from which you view the world. However, you've got to be one strong cat because when you start explaining this to your buddies at home, possibly your parents or your spouse or somebody, they'll say, come on, you've been in one of those stupid plate things again. <laughs> Crazy, that couldn't happen. They can't even imagine living with no debt. It, they won't permit themselves to even think of that. Now, I know what this is like because I lived there. Until I was 26, I was right into it over my head. And when Ray gave me that book, yet he started to talk like this to me, I wasn't sure if he was crazy or... I mean, I knew he didn't know me very well or he'd never suggest I could do these things. Now, I'm teaching these things. You have no idea how much your life can change. But this becomes your new home. And it's your workshop. This is how you work. This is how you live. And if you're observant, you're going to see outer reality shaping itself upon the model of your imagination. You start to see it changing in your physical world. People say, I don't see anything happen. I like the way Price Pritchett put it. Now, listen. He said, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Run that through your computer a couple of times. The absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because you can't see things happening, that doesn't mean it's not happening. There's all kinds of things happening right here in this room that we have no awareness of. When you think of the number of people in here and the ideas that we've been entertaining, man, there's all kinds of magic happening in the air. Now, when you move on to this higher frequency, you're going to be communicating with a world that is totally foreign to and beyond the reach of your five senses. So you're going to have to start using perception, the will, reason, imagination, memory, and intuition. If you don't learn how to use those things and consciously and deliberately start doing it, you can stay where you are. But, but absolutely nothing stays where, where, where it is because we do live in a notion of motion, so you're going to start slipping backwards. And that's what most people do. They slip backwards and they go a little ahead and then slip backwards and work like blazes to get a little ways ahead. And you'll even hear them, once it sits and trying, as soon as they get it done, another bill comes in. 
we can be in charge. Now, there is a place, and I like the way Steve Jobs put it, you cannot connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. But when you buy into this and you give it all you've got and you're working with the unseen world in your mind, things start to connect. And I don't care, we say this, and people laugh at it, you know, you get there and you think, God, it could have gone there. Well, that's gonna happen to you. You're gonna get to wherever you're going and then you think, damn, I could have gone further. Stretch your mind. Like Grace said to me, your way's not working, why don't you try mine? If your way's not working, try mine. You see, when you learn to control the flow, you're learning to control your life, literally. Now to move to a higher frequency of thought, you must first consent. I can't move you there, I can't do it for you. And then you have to adapt to the ideas and the feelings the new frequency represents. Sometimes when you first start changing, it seems like all hell's breaking loose, all kinds of things are changing in your life. Well, that'll happen. At the suggestion of a move, your paradigm's you're really gonna kick up, I call it trouble, trouble in River City. You know, there's gonna be problems and it'll continually fight you. The paradigm will always fight you. I don't care what it is you go to do, there's something inside that's gonna fight you. You've gotta understand what it is, and you gotta tell it to get out of here. It's almost like a little person inside of you saying, who do you think you are? Are you kidding yourself? You're never gonna do that. You're too stupid to figure that out. This is the way the little voice talks to us. And I don't care how smart you are, it'll talk to you that way. Because you can always go further and further, and when you do, you're going beyond what you're programmed to do. You gotta change the programming. Now when Ray sat down with me, he put an R in a sheet of paper. And then he put three letters down beside it, and he said, Bob, let this represent happiness, health, and wealth. Then he asked me if I thought he was a happy guy, and I said, yeah, he seemed pretty happy to me. He said, have you ever seen me sick? I said, no. And he kept going. He said, look, you're gonna be one of the most miserable people I've ever met. He did, and, and he was right. I was a miserable guy. I don't, listen, this is the God's truth. I look back in my life, and I don't think I was ever happy. I think I was an unhappy kid, I was born during a Great Depression. Things were really tough. When I just started to go to school, the whole world went to war, so everybody was rationed. Everybody was, we'd go to the show and we'd see newsreels of bombs falling, real things happening. This was my little life. I don't think I was ever happy. Now you'll say, well, God, you must have been happy sometimes. No, I don't think I ever was. I had fun, but fun and happiness are a long ways apart. Fun is very short-lived, and it's very shallow. Happiness runs very deep, and it's long-lasting. Now, it took me quite a while to figure that out. He said, you're in bad shape. I was earning $4,000 a year, and I owed six. And he said, do you ever read anything? I said, no, I can't read. Now, that wasn't true. I could read, not very well, but I could. I read about as well as most people. The average person reads at about a grade seven level because that's what we learned to read by the time we were in grade seven and never improved upon the skill from that point on. And that's when he introduced me to this book. And he said, right in the preface of this book, the author says there's a secret in the book. And he said, if you can find the secret in the book, you can have anything you seriously want. And then he shows all the people that endorse it. My God, there's a list in here that would blow you away. Notable individuals that said, no, that's true, there is a secret, and if you find it, you can have anything you want. 
And I started to think of why it wouldn't work for me, because I hadn't gone to school, and, you know, never had a good job. Well, he pointed out some of them that hadn't gone to school either. But he said that didn't stop them. He said, you got to decide what you want. I've written down what I want ever since then. That was in 1961. I always know, I always get a card. Every time I touch it, a light message goes firing through my central nervous system, activates the cells in my brain that have the picture of what's written on this card impregnated into a group of cells in my brain, and it caused me to see it, think of it. In one year, my income went to 175,000, from 4,000 dollars a year to 175. Now I hadn't actually, I hadn't actually earned 175, but I was at 14,500 a month. So if you annualize that, that's what I would have been earning. I didn't think it would last. But I remember seeing James Cagney being interviewed. Some of you do know him, some of you don't know of him. He was a phenomenal actor. And, God, he was an actor as long as I can remember. And I remember him saying he never thought it would last. So I, I was in good company not thinking it. See, you don't think it'll last because you don't understand how it's happening. When you start to understand how it's happening, you not, only don't, you not only know it'll last, it'll get better. And for me, it did. In less than five years, I had it over a million dollars. And I had absolutely no idea what the hell I was doing. I really didn't. If somebody said, what were you doing? I said, I'm cleaning offices. They said, you must be cleaning a lot of them. I said, yeah, we do. A lot of them. Toronto, Montreal, Boston, Cleveland, Atlanta, London, England. See, Ignorance goes a long ways. I would just fly into a city and start a company. I never thought I couldn't do it. I just went and do it. I did it in Toronto. Why can't I do it in Boston? What the hell? If I did it in Boston and, and I did it, in, you know, in, uh, in Atlanta, I could do it in England. So that's what I did. And I had it going all over the place. Now, I started to learn lessons here. She so he says in there, yep, he said there's a difference between wishing for a thing and being ready to receive it. No one's ready for a thing until they believe that they can acquire it. The state of must be belief and not mere hope or wish. Now he said open-minded is essential to belief. Do you know a lot of people don't have an open mind? If it's beyond where they're at, they say, I don't believe that. Now, if it's real bad, they'd believe that. It's the way they're programmed. How do you get ready? How are you ready for this better life? You got to believe. You see, hoping and wishing isn't going to cut it. Hell, I'd been hoping and wishing far back in my life as I could remember. I wish this had happened. I wish that. God, I hope things get better. I hope this is a good year. I don't do it. You got to believe. You really got to believe. That word puzzles the daylights out of most people. I found from my mentor that your belief system is based upon your evaluation of something. Frequently, if you reevaluate something, your belief about it will change. Now, let's do, deal just with ours, uh, ourself. Let's get specific. If I want to believe in me more than I do, then I better get to know me a little better than I do. I'm not Bob. This isn't me. When I first heard somebody say that, I thought, what the hell is this guy talking about? I had no idea what he was talking about. You'll never see me. I will never see me. Me is non-physical. Me is pure, unadulterated spirit. That's what me is. I better know me. If I want to believe in me, 
I better get to know me. Bill Gove says, if I want to be free, I got to be me. Not to me I think you think I should be. Not to me I think my kids think I should be. If I want to be free, I got to be me. So he said, I better figure out who me is. When you know who you are, you can go anywhere and do anything. That doesn't mean you're going to be making it happen real well all the time. But if I start something new, I know I've got to learn it. I remember we were working with a chalkboard, and then we got to flip charts, then we got overhead projectors, and then PowerPoint came out. I didn't know how to start a computer. Jane Wilhite gave me my first computer, and Rob up there at the ranch was trying to teach me how to use it. I'm sure he thought this guy's never going to figure this out. I didn't even know where the button was to start it. And so I got this computer, and then I got Gene over, and I said, Gina knew something about computers, and I said, well, make me some PowerPoints. She said, what do you want? Can you want? She said, she has, I think I can make some. So I tell her, and she I said, that's not what I want. She said, that's what you said you wanted. And I said, no, it's not what I said at all. You see, I had a picture in my mind, and she wasn't making it on a slide. And I realized if I want to get what I want, I better learn how to make it. And so I had a young guy from a college come in and give me some lessons. But you know what it's like learning on a computer. My God, you learn this, and then there's a whole string of things, and if you forget any one of them, you're screwed. It's all buggered up. <laughs> you see? So they come in and give me a lesson, and he'd be gone. I would say, what did he teach me? I figured out the only way you're going to learn it is by doing it. So I started to do it. And I learned how to do it. I got pretty good at it. I make all my own slides. Now, I believe there's some things I don't know how to do. But I believe if I got really emotionally involved in it, I could learn how to do it. But I have to get somebody to teach me. So the idea of sitting back and saying, yeah, I know how to do it. If you don't know how to do it, admit it. Go to somebody that's really good at it. Ask them what to do and do exactly what they tell you. See, that was the big thing I learned from Ray. I said, do exactly what I tell you. And I did. And you see, the benefit of doing it with him, he was the first guy that mentored me. When I went to the next guy, he didn't have to tell me that. I had learned that. I didn't know enough to tell you I'd learned that, but I learned it. I would do exactly what they say, whether I agreed or not. I didn't even know what they were talking about usually, but I'd do exactly what they said. And if you've got a mentor or a teacher or a trainer, and you're not doing what they tell you, you ought to fire them or leave them because you're wasting their time and yours. And if I'm training somebody, if they're paying me, I have one person who pays me um, 250000 a year to mentor them. I just meet this person once a quarter for a day, and I talk to them once a week for about 15 minutes. And if they don't do exactly what I said, they're fired, and they know that. Because I don't want to waste my time, and I don't want to waste their time. Now, this person does exactly what I say. And she has earned over a million a month just since I started to talk to her. You see, if you want to get good at something, go to somebody that's demonstrated they're good at it and ask them and do exactly what they tell you. Don't argue with them. Now, that doesn't mean you won't find a better way. You probably will. But down the road, but do what they tell you until you've got it down pretty good. And remember this, no more effort is required to aim high, to demand abundance and prosperity than is required to accept misery and poverty. It doesn't take any more energy. Now, there's the guy on the right that wrote this book and the guy on the left that mentored him. There's a huge lesson here that everyone in this room can benefit from, but Odds are you won't do it right away because your paradigm will try and rip you away from it. 
Andrew Carnegie had a goal. He was looking for someone. He was the richest man in the world in 1903. It's estimated that he was the first billionaire. He thought it was an absolute shame that people like himself, like Henry Ford and Thomas Edison, were going to their grave with all this knowledge locked up in their bones. No one had ever written the laws of achievement. No one had ever gathered this information. And he was looking for somebody to do it. Now, around the same time, Napoleon Hill was a young guy in his early 20s. He was working for a little magazine that was going to write articles on wealthy people. And he nailed a three-day or a three-hour interview with Andrew Carnegie. Now you can imagine, I would imagine it was gonna be a little intimidated for the guy at that time. But he went, he had three hours with him. And at the end of the three hours, Carnegie said, this interview isn't ending, it's just beginning. He said, I want you to come home with me. He'll say he was glad he took him home because he didn't have enough money to rent a hotel room. And they spent three days together. Yet at the end of the three days, he said, now Napoleon, you have everything that I know. I've shared it all with you. I want to ask you a question. And I just want a yes or a no answer. He said, are you prepared to spend the rest of your life researching a concept for which you will probably receive no material compensation for at least 20 years. God, I've asked myself that question so many times. What would I have said if I'd have been him? I think I would have said yes, because he said yes. I think if I'd spent three days with him, I'd realize this guy is a square shooter. I mean, he's, he's not going to ask me to do something that, you know, is wrong. So he'll say, yes, he would. I said, I just want a yes or no answer. What he didn't tell Hill, or tell Napoleon Hill, he had a stopwatch in his hand, and he only gave him 60 seconds to answer the question. That's a big question answered in 60 seconds. And he, uh, in 25 seconds, he said he would. So he told him what it was. He said, I want you to go out. And he said, oh, by the way, I'm not going to subsidize you. I won't give you any money. You're going to have to work and earn your way through this deal, which would probably knock the stilts under for most people. And um, he said, you're going to have a lot of problems. He said, long before you finish everything in you, Napoleon's going to want to quit. So I said, I'm going to give you an affirmation. I want you to write this out. I want you to write every word, underline every word. He said, now you're going to be talking to yourself, Napoleon, but you're talking to me. And you're going to say, Andrew Carnegie, I'm not only going to equal your achievements in life, but I'm going to challenge you at the post and pass you at the grandstand. The wealthiest guy in the world. You're saying that to him, and he's broke. Andrew Carnegie, I'm not only going to equal your achievements in life, I'm going to challenge you at the post and pass you at the grandstand. Now, he'll sit, he threw his pencil on the floor, and he says, now you know darn well that's not going to happen. He says, I know it's not Napoleon, unless and until you burn that into your mind. Now, he said, I want you to give me your word that you will read that looking in the mirror at yourself every morning and every night for 30 days. Well, he said, I could do that. So he said, yes, I'll give you my commitment to do that. But he still thought it was silly. The first time he did it, he locked himself in the bathroom. He didn't want his brother to hear him. He was living with his brother. And he whispered it.
He said the first few days he thought he was absolutely crazy doing this. But he said by the middle of the month, he thought maybe this could happen. By the end of the month, he knew it would happen. Now, Napoleon Hill executed this promise. I have studied a lot about Carnegie, and I've read where he's made anywhere from 20 to 50 millionaires in his lifetime. Napoleon Hill has made millions of millionaires, literally millions of millionaires, and he's still making them, although he's gone through his material. Helped me earn a million dollars a long time ago. A decision must be a committed decision. And it has to be mixed with discipline. Give yourself a command and follow it. Now, the big decisions aren't for lightweights. But if you really understand the law, there isn't any such thing as a big decision. There's only decisions. Now, think. You must begin to think. Many people believe that success is a matter of being in the right place at the right time. There may be a grain of truth in that, but I'm going to tell you something. You have to be aware that you're in the right place at the right time. I was in the right place at the right time on a number of different occasions, but I didn't I wasn't aware of it, so I missed the opportunity. Now, let's look at this for a moment. There's seven levels of, of awareness here. I don't have the time today to spend at this that I want, but I'm going to go over it, so I want you to pay attention. This is where you start down here, in an animalistic state. In fact, there's some animals that are way ahead of you when you're born. You watch little horses are up on their feet. They may be wobbly, but they stand up. Watch little puppies, they're running around. You see birds, they're kicked out of the nest. In this very low state of conscious awareness, we react to almost everything. When we master this, we respond, we don't react. Now, In an animalistic state, it's fight or flight. That's how some people live their whole life, fight or flight. As you master this, as you learn to control the flow, it's respond, you think and you plan. This is so, so obvious. So we move from this animalistic state into a higher level of consciousness and we start following the masses. The masses, that's the paradigms. They're all locked into the same concepts and they're following each other. And although you may be locked into the masses, something happens. You aspire to something better, something greater than you've already got. That happened to some of you in here. Hopefully it happened to everybody. You had a desire for something greater than you've got and something inside says, of course you can do it. Now, how does that happen? Because you're an individual expression of life. You're God's highest form of creation. And you want to express your uniqueness. You see, that's happening inside of us. You want to express your uniqueness as a human being. And this desire grows. And as you go to do it, that damn paradigm pulls you back. Every time you step out, you're going to make it happen. The paradigm pulls you back. You're going to go ahead. The paradigm pulls you back. And then you hear that if you're disciplined, if you give yourself a command and follow it, you're going to pull it, pull it off. So you're going to do it. But the paradigm pulls you back but no, you step out, and pretty soon the discipline dissipates, and all that great thinking was nothing but a wish. 
And even though you're here and sit in a seminar surrounded by people, you're aware you're stuck. You're stuck. Now keep thinking. How do you get unstuck? You've got to discipline yourself. It's the ability to give yourself a command and follow it. Wants and discipline must be connected. You've got to think of what you want. Yet, even though there's a lot of bad conditioning in a paradigm, you're going to discipline yourself. I am going after this position. I'm going to earn this kind of an income. I'm going to buy that house. And so there you are, when the discipline starts to fade, you say, wait a minute. I'm not going to buy that. It's not going to remain a wish. I am going to do this. That's what Hill did. And I'm going to tell you, I remember when this happened to me. You've got to give yourself a command. You've got to, you know, step up. And when you do that, your actions are going to change your results because you did it. And the change in results, the feedback, that's a learning experience. What you did, you took an idea and you acted on it. And you're going to find all that old stuff started to die and the new idea took over and you have mastered your own thinking. It's a big deal. When you learn to do that, you give it you want. You got to quit fooling around with the A's and B's. Sandy was talking about that. You got to go after the C, what you really want. You see, you don't know how, but you know you will. You don't know how you, but you know you will. It's an inner knowing. There's no saying when you hear the truth, you'll know it. What does that mean? Well, let's think of this for a moment. There's music in this room right now. We don't hear it, but there is. There's all kinds of movies playing in this room. You've got classicals, you've got all kinds of censored movies, everything. It's all in this room. We just don't see it or we don't hear the music. Now, if we had a little radio and we turned the radio on, what we would do, we would tune in on that frequency. You see, the, broad, the broadcasting company is sending the frequency, sending the message out, and it's in the room, but our ears are not on that frequency. The radio picks it up, speeds it up, and sends it back out on the frequency that your ears are operating on. And you start to hear it. Well, when you hear the truth, the truth resonates with the essence of who you are. The truth resonates. It's just like the signal resonates with the receiver in the radio. Well, the truth resonates with the essence of who you are, that spiritual perfection within you. And as it resonates, whoo, it sends out a new vibration on a conscious level. It's called knowing. And you just know it's right. You just know what I'm telling you is the right thing. You know this is right. You know it. Yeah, you're going to go home and you're going to try and share this with somebody. But because you haven't trained yourself over the last 59 years to explain this in any way you want, they're going to look at you. You've got to be crazy. You're trying to tell me I can do anything I want. Grow me another arm. <laughs> Listen, that's all they can do. They don't know any different. They're not even aware enough to open their mind. Let's ask ourselves, how does all life operate? All life grows exactly the same way. It grows by law. People have been giving me acorns later. I've got three or four acorns in, at home, big ones and small ones and cup acorns. And you take the acorn as a seed. You know, Aristotle used to hold it up in front of a class and say, what is this? He wanted the people to tell him it was an oak tree. Aristotle was wrong. It's not an oak tree. It's an acorn. It is a seed. There's no oak tree in the seed. But there is a pattern plan in that seed that controls the vibratory rate of the seed, the acorn. Now, if you take two drops of water in a class top table and push them together, they become one. 
You've heard the saying, what God has joined together gives it new meaning. You'll never separate that one drop into exactly the same two drops again. You won't do it. Well, there's energy packed right up against the acorn in the earth, right smack against it, but it's not on the same frequency as the acorn. So it doesn't mix with the acorn. However, some distance away, there is energy that's in perfect harmony with the acorn, and there's little particles of energy marching like good soldiers right to the acorn. And when they get there, they resonate with that acorn. And just like the two drops come together, you get a bigger drop. When the energy is attracted to the acorn, the acorn does the only thing it can do, it expands. And shoots come out of the bottom, and shoots come out of the top, it breaks through the earth, then it attracts from the atmosphere, as well as from the earth, particles of energy that are in harmony with it. See, the oak tree is in the universe. The pattern plan is in the seed. It's the pattern plan that controls the vibration of the acorn. The energy that created the acorn was always here. It's in harmony with and was attracted to the seed. So the acorn's in the earth. The energy for the oak tree is in the universe. The law of attraction brought them together. Do you know that you grow exactly the same way as the acorn? Here's the deal. You get an idea and you plant that in your heart, in your subjective mind, that controls the vibration you're in. And if you keep feeding that idea, you stay in that vibration and you will attract all the good you want is already here. You're going to get in harmony with it. Now, if you say, oh, I don't know about this, show it to me. No, no, don't get it that way. You've got to believe. If you don't believe, you're toast. Forget it. Now, let's look at this. Why do we go around like that? Because we don't have a good education. You're getting a good education here. The yellow represents an educational model. The white represents the Proctor Gallagher Institute's model. Now, there's the person, and they have senses. And they go to school, and they hear the teacher. You hear the teacher. You hear with your ears. And because you hear the teacher, you start gathering information. The books start to pile up in the consciousness. And then in a certain period of time, the teacher comes along and gives you a test they want to see if you've learned it. And if you pass the test, they'll say you know it. Now, there's the first great fallacy. Just because you can repeat what's in the book doesn't mean you know it. That's not knowing. Now, think of this. Hearing and listening are two completely different things. Hearing, you hear with your ears, you listen with your emotions. You gotta let yourself get emotionally involved in this. Just hearing it won't cut it. Learning is not gathering information. Learning is when you consciously entertain an idea, you internalize it, you get emotionally involved with that idea, then you step out and act on the idea and you change the end result. It's the change in result, it's the feedback from the change in result that is the learning experience. Ah, I see, if I get emotionally involved and do this, the results change, I've learned. Now this is what accounts for people that have gathered all kinds of information, read many great books, listened to many great professors, wrote the exams and passed them, they got the degrees coming right off the end of their business card, and they do nothing. They're very frustrated because they're so smart, and they got crappy results, where another person doesn't even go to school. But he learned something. I learned if I do exactly what I think he's telling me, I can become wealthy. It's helped me earn millions of dollars, and I'm not that smart. I just got a couple of good habits. When paradigms stay in control, nothing changes. We've got to understand that. 
Now, there's only two ways to change a paradigm, just two. One of them is the constant spaced repetition of ideas that are essentially opposite to the paradigm. And I've told you about that time and time again. If you take information and record it, and you listen to it over and over and over again, you'll be able to repeat it. That doesn't mean you're going to do it. But keep listening to it every day, every day. You program it into your subconscious. You'll automatically start doing it. You will defy all the intellectuals. You not only get into a beautiful vibration and track what you have to attract, you will affect the thinking of all other people because of the vibration you're in. Constant spaced repetition. Now, there's another way. Very few people use it for good reason. And that's the personal experience of an emotional impact. 9-11 was an emotional impact, not for me, but for people that were living in it. Usually emotional impacts are of a negative nature. We were thinking about that one time. I was thinking about it in a plane going to Asia. And I thought, God, it can't all be negative. There has to be positive in the impact. And I started to study, you've got to get obsessed with an idea. And then I thought obsession is a negative concept. I thought, well, it can't be a negative concept. Lloyd C. Douglas wrote a book, The Magnificent Obsession. So I thought, hell, The Magnificent Obsession. So I looked up obsession. An obsession is a persistent, disturbing preoccupation with an often unreasonable idea. That's what an obsession is. A persistent, disturbing preoccupation with an often unreasonable idea. So I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get some guys together that are pretty smart guys, and we're going to create a seminar that will have an impact on people's minds. And we did the million dollar form, and that's where the chicken soup came out of it. But all kinds of great things come out of that. That was really, it was phenomenal. We had just some of the best teachers in the world. We charged $7,500 to go to it, but it cost us 10000 to have you in it. So volume wasn't going to change it. We were blowing our brains out doing this. But we're having such a good time, we blew our brains out for a while, and then we stopped doing it. You know, well, that's life, isn't it? Now look it. I want to show you how repetition works. It is illogical to listen to the same thing over and over again, but that's how I changed my life. It took me nine and a half years to figure this out. Nine and a half years. I kept listening to the same recording. The white line represents the sound of a record playing. The red line represents you listening. Remember I said listening is emotionally involved. So that line there, the white line represents, it's representative of the sound of a recording playing. Now watch this. Watch the screen. The red line represents you listening to the recording. So you go along and listen, and bang, an idea hits, and off you go on a thought trip. And you're up here on a thought frequency. You are not listening. You hear it. But you're thinking about that idea that hit your mind. And you think about it for a while, and then you finally come back down, and you start listening. And then all of a sudden, bang, another idea hits you, and away you go on another thought trip. Do you know that you could listen to the same recording a thousand times and only think of the specific idea once? Now watch. You've got to ask, how did you get programmed in the first place? You were programmed as an infant. Remember I showed you? Subconscious is wide open, and the idea just going in. Well, when you're listening, that's the way your mind is. When you're listening, you're not thinking, you're listening, you're just listening to the message over and over and over again. That's why this works. You see, the odds of you listening to the same idea every time is pretty remote. You may be listening to it there, but the next time you put it on, the idea back here hits you. God, you're thinking about it. When the first idea comes up, you only thought about it once. Can you imagine where you'd be at if your parents told you when you were a little kid, your name's Bob, and I'm only telling you once, so don't forget it. 
<laughs> you know? Think about it. They tell you over and over and over and over and over, and you keep calling them by name, and then one day the kid <laughs> looks. Now, if there's a crowd of people and you yell, Bob! All the Bobs turn around. It takes a while, though, to get the mind programmed. We got to program ourselves for the good that we desire. So we keep playing it over and over and over. I'm going to show you something about a decision that most people never in their whole life learn, and that's why there's only about 5% of the population that are winning. I want you to start thinking of what you want. Now think of this. Every thought is hooked up to the one above and the one below. We've already covered that. They're all hooked up. Let's suppose that represents my phone, and this represents your phone. I can get onto the same frequency as you if I have your number. We seem to have a basic understanding of this when using phones. However, when it comes to life, we get lost. We know how this works. Now, we may not be engineers and don't really get into it, but I know if I've got your phone number in there, and I hit, and I hit send, it doesn't matter where you are. I'll reach you. Now, you may not answer the phone, but your phone will be reached. And if you get on the phone, you could be in Singapore, and I'm right here in, or in L.A. I didn't think of where I was. Uh, then we're going to communicate successfully. You know, you can do that without a phone. It's called telepathic communication. And some people are very good at it. I'm sort of good at it. Now watch. We understand that with the phone. Now let's pay attention here. Let these lines represent levels of vibration. Levels of vibration are very, very referred to as frequencies. Now, we think on frequencies. Now, I want you to just think, just think of your life. Forget about everything else and forget about me. Just listen and get the picture of your life. You are thinking right now on this frequency. This would be the frequency you're thinking on, and so that dictates the results you're getting. You cannot get results beyond your level of thinking. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. James Allen said, mind is the master power that molds and makes, and man is mind. And evermore he takes the tool of thought and shaping what he wills. He brings forth a thousand joys or a thousand ills. We think in secret, but it comes to pass. Environment is but our looking glass. You don't have a difficult time to tell what a person's thinking like. Look at their results. Watch the way they move. See how they treat people. Now look at, we'll say, that's where I am. When that's where I really want to go. And you're talking to them and say, yeah, that's, that's exactly where I want to go. Well, why don't you go there? I'm going to. I'm making a decision. That's what I'm going to do. As soon as I get the money. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to do that. As soon as the kids are out of school, that's when I'm going to do it. I'm going to do that right after the first of the year. That's when I'm going to do it, when this changes. You know what happens? Pretty soon the decision fades and dies. It's only a short period of time later that the goal fades and dies. Why? Because the person's thinking on this frequency. And the goal that they require, the goal they want, it requires them to think up here on this frequency. I can't get you on the phone if I'm phoning my brother. Well, you can't get the goal if you're down here thinking the same way. And you say, well, when I get the money, I'll start doing it. When I get the help, I'll start doing it. When she agrees with me, I'll start, uh-uh. Sorry, doesn't work that way, Jack. You got to do it. 
you got to step up and do it. Here's what you got to do. You got to say, I am going to make a committed decision. This I will do. This I'll do. I sat in a den in a house on Maplewood Lane in Glenview, Illinois. They took this pen and I wrote, I'm going to build a company that operates all over the world. I had absolutely no idea how I was going to do it. No idea how I was going to do it. Didn't have any help. I had a little bit of money, but sure not enough to do what I was going to do. But I was committed. I had studied this long enough. I was doing exactly what it was saying as far as I was concerned. You think and act like the person you want to become. Now, back up. You're down there. The second you make a committed decision, you've got to think and act like the person you want to become. When you do that, you get thinking on that higher frequency. When you're thinking up there, you start to hear and see things that you never would have seen. Everything that's necessary will happen. It's like I told John and Pat in the Born Rich book. They wanted to buy a house, and they said, go buy one. They said, we can't buy a house. We don't have any money. I said, you don't need any money. They looked at me rather strange, and I said, you haven't made a decision to buy the house. What the hell do you need the money for? Have you any idea the number of people that are wrestling with the idea about buying the house, building the business, taking the trip, because they're not sure they'll have enough when the time comes? Well, if they don't make a committed decision, they can pretty well bank on the fact they won't have what it needs when the time comes. But if they make a committed decision, it will be there. Ask and you'll receive. Now look it. Want is the only prerequisite for making a decision. That's the only thing. Do you want to do it? Then make a decision you're going to do it. Doesn't matter about the money, the help, whether you know how. None of that matters. It's do you want it? If you want it, if you really want it, make the decision. Do you know what salespeople are? Great salespeople, they're want creators. They keep fitting ideas to people and they keep jiggling that higher side of them, keep expanding their mind. That's why successful people make decisions so fast. Carnegie tested Hill. He gave him 60 seconds to answer a question that he would take on a project for 20 years. That's also why Dr. Werner von Braun answered John Kennedy when he said, what it would take us to build a rocket that will carry a person to the moon, bring him back safely to Earth? He said, the will to do it. That's all it takes. He didn't say you'd need money, engineers, rocket scientists, none of that. Just the will to do it. See, Von Braun knew if you fell in love with an idea and you held that idea on the screen of your mind, you'll attract everything that's required. That's all you need to get done what you want, the will to do it. It's like when I asked Anders, how do you create an illusion? You just start with something that's impossible and then you work backwards. And they figure it out. There's Kennedy, and there's the good doctor. He's considered the father of the space program. And he answered Kennedy, the will to do it. That's all you require. Now, your paradigm may be stro so strong that you can't operate on that. And if you can't, you're going to stay where you are. This idea is better to be safe than sorry is a bunch of nonsense. It's not better to be safe than sorry at all. You get a bet on you. Quit asking the guy next door, your brother-in-law, what they think. They probably don't think. <laughs> they know. But I'll tell you one thing, I'll bet they have an opinion. You gotta control the flow. Make the decision. Discipline yourself to act on it. 
Now, we're going to bring this in for landing on a very favorite subject of mine, compensation, money. Um, I was talking to Cynthia Kersey earlier today, and if I got it right, I think this group here is putting together enough money to build four schools, is that correct? Yeah. And how many kids would that be? Uh, 300 children. <laughs> There's 300 children in Africa that are going to get nutritious food, proper medical care, clean water, and they're going to be able to learn. That, a week ago, that couldn't happen for them. And I don't think anybody here went broke making a donation. You know, we, um, we give a lot of money to Cynthia's company, a lot of money, over the years. A few million dollars, I guess. But you know something? When we started to do that, and our company really started to move ahead. We became so much more prosperous. I love the way Jane Wellhite puts it, givers gain. Givers gain. Become a little more generous, and you'll probably become a little more wealthy. Now, let's think of the law of compensation. Everything in the universe operates by law. Compensation go is governed by a law. It's a very exact law. That law clearly states the amount of money you earn will always be, always, not sometimes, always be in exact ratio to three things. One, the need for what you do. Two, your ability to do it, and three, the difficulty there is in replacing you. Where's Madison sitting? She, she in here? Is Madison in here? Come on up here. Hmm? How you doing? Give me a hug. <laughs> she was on stage last night. Madison's 23. She became a consultant with us last October. Since last October, Madison's earned around $300,000. Crazy, isn't it? Think of that. Somebody said, well, she's not worth $300,000. Yes, she is. If she wasn't, she wouldn't get it. You know why she got that? She's provided a lot of service. See, we think money comes from doing a lot of work. No, no. You didn't work hard. Did you have a good time? Yeah. It was a little fun. Yeah. Plan to do it again? Yeah, many times over. <laughs> many, you'll probably do it better. What does it actually feel like? Surreal. Feels surreal. Hold on. You turn this on? There we go. Um, it feels very surreal. Um, if you practice what we teach, then when it happens, it's kind of like, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? You know what I mean. <laughs> I think I do. Yeah. But the crazy part is, you're not really thinking about what you're earning when you're doing it. No. No. You're so into helping a person understand something that you're probably still fascinated with. Yes, every day. Do you want to know something? I'm still fascinated with it. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter how long you study, you're still, you're sort of fascinated watching the magician. Where's Peggy? Who is it? Al? What was his name? Where's Peggy? Al she? Henderson. Al Henderson. He wrote something. 
He said, when you watch a magician, you think, wow, that's magic. But he said, when you learn the trick, there's not magic anymore. I've worked with a number of magicians and I can see through most of the, the tricks and it's not, it's nothing. He said, when you understand how a trick works, you're not fascinated. But when you understand how you work, that's magic. And that's what you're experiencing at 23. God, have you any idea where you'll be at when you're 30 or 25? People keep saying that. What would you do at 23? What would I do? You were 26, right? I was 26, yeah. But I took off just about the same way. Well, I really didn't know what the hell I was doing. You know what you're doing. You see, there's a big difference there. You're operating with a conscious awareness. I was operating out of ignorance. You know that if you keep doing it, you keep following the rules. Now, I'm going to tell you, it'd be easy to break the rules. You know, you'll get tempted. That's got nothing to do with 23. You could be 83 and still be tempted. You got to stay on track. I always say you got to stick to your knitting. What do you think you'll do for the remainder of the year? Well, like our, our financial goal? Mm -hmm. Not Ten. ours, yours. Ten million a month. Ten million a month. Now listen. Some of you, your head's going to be where my head was when Mark Victor Hansen said, we're going to sell 50 million before the turn of the century. I thought this guy's smoking something. <laughs> he didn't sell 50 million, he sold 73 million. I became a much greater belief. Now, you immediately think, how are you going to do that? Well, you've got to leverage yourself. But you're learning that. Your dad's a pretty smart guy. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> this is what we're talking about here in the law of compensation. She got a lot of compensation because she provided a lot of service. A lot of service. There's 50 people that have the tools to live a much better life because Madison came in contact with them. They got a much bigger win than her, but she got a lot of money out of it. Congratulations. <laughs> Give her a big hand. Good. Now, Think, the need for what you do. A lot of people think if you work harder, it's not about working hard. Some of the people who work the hardest earn the least. It's about providing service. Let's build a scenario that you don't see much anymore. People used to operate elevators. They would stand in the elevator, and you get on, and they'd say, floor, please, and you'd say, six, and they would crank a thing, and away you'd go to the sixth floor. So let's say a person gets on, operates this floor, please, six, okay, boom, boom, boom. Doors open, let them off the sixth floor. About two hours later, the doors open, the same guy steps on, ground floor, lobby, boom, boom. Doors open, and they're on. The guy that got off on the sixth floor and stayed there for two hours would probably earn more money in that two hours than that elevator operator would earn in two years. Might have been a neurosurgeon. See, the elevator operator was providing a service, but not much. With a neurosurgeon, that's quite a better service. That's where this is at. This is a law. The need for what you do, your ability to do it, and the difficulty there will be in replacing you. See, the focus is on this one. You want to work at getting better at what you do. I am always attempting to improve how I explain this. I want to do a much better job today than I did yesterday. 
Now, I might not do as well today as I did yesterday, but I'm going to give it everything I've got, and that's all you can do. You're getting the best you can get from me today. You might have got better yesterday, you may get better tomorrow, but you can't get any better than you're getting today. If you give the best you've got, you're going to go ahead. Most people don't operate that way. Get into the habit of operating that way. Now look, it. I love what Earl said. Most people think they want more money than they really do, and they settle for a whole lot less than they could get. And it must be earned. When you make effective use of your paradigm power, you can decide to turn your annual income into a monthly income. Look at what young Madison just did. I texted her dad today and I said, you know, she's young, she's beautiful, she's ambitious, and she's quickly becoming very wealthy. I said, you've really got to be proud of her. And he is. You can turn your annual income to a monthly income. Now, there's three income strategies, just three. There's a million ways to earn them, but only three strategies. I refer to it as M1, M2, and M3. Now, if you have little kids, teach them the M3 strategy. 99, 95% of the people use the M1 strategy. It doesn't work. This is where 96% of the people work, they're trading their time for money. I don't care how much you earn an hour, you got a cap on it, because you run out of time. Everybody gets the same amount of time. And when it's gone, it's gone. You don't get it back. That's not a good strategy. And yet, that's the one that masses operate with. That's one we learn mostly from our parents in school. M2 is a good strategy, but it's only used by a small percentage, 3% of the population. And that 3% invest money to earn money. You see, you can put this stuff to work for you without you doing anything. It'll earn money for you. Now, M3 is something I stumbled on way back in the 60s. I had no idea what I was doing. But it was like I was bagging the money, and I didn't know what I was doing. 1% of the population follow this strategy. That 1% are 96% of all the money. I was doing a TV show with Robin Leach a number of years ago. Now, he has dealt with more wealthy people. He's gone now, God bless him. But he dealt with more wealthy people than probably anybody alive. And, you know, if you're shooting something, uh, camera, you, you sit around and do a lot of nothing while you're waiting. And so he and I would chat for a while, and I found him a pretty interesting guy. Now, he has talked to the wealthiest in the world, and he said the wealthiest he knows, he's never seen them working. And we grow up with the idea you go to work to earn money. You don't go to work to earn money at all. That's a dumb idea. And if that's the idea you've got, get rid of it real fast. You go to work for satisfaction. You provide service to earn money. If you're not doing what you love to do, what are you doing with your life? You're wasting your life. Life is rather short. When it's over, it's all done. You take nothing with you. Everything you own at the time of your death is going to belong to somebody else. Now, if you can never own anything, you should never let it own you. These are simple rules. Most people don't learn. This is what I stumbled on. They multiply their time by setting up multiple sources of income. You have your brochure in your table for Matrix. One day I was flying somewhere. And uh, at the end of a seminar, I always wish I had more time. I was thinking, if I had more time, God, what could I do with a person? And then I thought, 
I'm going to think of that. Let's suppose I have a week, a solid week. Oh, my God, you could change lives in a week, literally. And so I created this concept, and then I called it matrix, because matrix is birthplace. We have keep, people come to the matrix, they really change their life. Some of you know Alex. He came to Matrix. Alex wrote a book in Matrix. He wrote 40% of a book while Matrix was on. The man I'm talking about, I think he's up around a million a month or better. Young guy. <laughs> Matrix is, it's, it's a dynamic concept. We're there for a whole week, and this is why we're there. We teach them how to do this. You see, our world is changing. Our world is changing so fast, it's hard to keep up with. It's not getting bigger, it's getting smaller. You're not a long way from anywhere anymore. The world's getting smaller. You can have business all over the world. We do. We're dealing in 118 countries right now as I'm talking providing service in 118 countries. When I wrote that goal that I was going to operate all over the world, do you think I had any idea that we could do this? No. No idea. That's just come to me over the last few years. You don't know what you're capable of doing. You don't know what's going to happen. You can have business all over the world. You see, you set up MSIs, multiple sources of income. And that's what you do, you just keep setting them up. Phil Goldfine and Robert Vescuzzi and I sat at breakfast the other morning, and uh, I don't know about them, but I'm kind of jazzed with the idea we were talking about. It can be huge. Oh, millions, millions of dollars. It, just one MSI. And then you just keep setting them up all over the place. Because you can think and you're a creative being. Anyone that comes to Matrix leads a different person. Why? Because this is the focus. And we show them. They make contacts there. Many of them set up joint ventures there. You have no idea who's sitting with you, who's sitting beside you. And you just keep setting them up. There's no end because you're dealing with infinite. Now, the question, because you look at the graphic allocation or illustration, are all the sources of income the same size? Oh, hell no. Some are big and some are small. Some die, some grow. But they've all got one thing in common. They all flow into your bank. It doesn't matter where they come from. It comes in one currency. Your bank trains it into your currency. It's, um, it's really a neat idea. Dave's down in Trinidad now. Yeah. All around the world. Woo. And so is Steve. I had a text from him. He's down in Trinidad. So they're setting up sources of income in Trinidad. And when they leave, the money will start coming in from Trinidad. You like that idea? Yeah. I think it's a cool idea. Madison loves the idea. That's what this book was all about. This is where it started with me. Now, you um, can leave here and say, you know, this is really good information. And do nothing. Because that's what happens to some people.
where you can leave and just go like a rocket. I have found if you don't make a decision in this room, the odds are pretty good you won't make one when you leave the room. Clearly understand this, you don't need anybody's permission to make a decision. Yes. Now most of us don't know how to make decisions. We really don't. Brian's up here talking about some of the lessons that he's learned from me. Do you know in his whole life I have never made a decision for him? Not once. Even when he was a little boy. Though he's got a brother and sister, I've never made decisions for them. I found that most parents make decisions for their kids, and then when their kids get out on their own, they don't know how to make a decision for themselves. So they find mom and dad, what do you think I should do? I think you should think and do what you want. But they don't do that. I tell a story about Raymond. He's a bigger guy than Brian. And uh, Raymond, in high school, was on swim team. And Phil knows this. He's in the pool at 5 o'clock every morning. We would hear Raymond leave the house at 5 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, I guess it's not really pleasant getting out of a warm bed and going to dive into a cold pool at 5 o'clock in the morning. But he was on the swim team, and he's a big guy, and they liked having him on the swim team. I had talked to a coach on a couple of occasions, and they liked him because he was so big and strong, he would be anchor, swim anchor on these teams. And they did well. And this went on for quite a while. And one day, Raymond came, and I don't know where I was in the house, but I was somewhere, and anybody that's a parent could recognize this. I always say that they're like circling the field. They're walking around, and you know they're going to lay something on you. You just don't know what it is. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, Dad, could, uh, could I talk to you? And I said, sure. Well, he said, um, I'm thinking of quitting the swim team. What do you think? I said, geez, I don't know, right? I'm not on the swim team. Well, yeah, but he said, you must have an opinion. I said, no, I really don't, Ray. Um, I said, why are you quitting? Well, he said, I've been thinking about it. And he said, you know, I'm not going to use swimming when I leave school. Work at it. I said, no, unless you're going to be a life lifeguard or something, you probably won't. And I knew that wasn't the reason at all. I knew he was tired of getting up at five in the morning and jumping in the cold pool. <laughs> and um, I said, have you talked to the coach about it? No, not yet, but, but, um, but I will. Well, I said, what do you think he'll think? Well, I don't know. I said, well, you probably do know, right? You, and I do. No, I said, I don't know. Well, He said, what do you think? I said, Ray, I don't know. I really don't know. I said, it's not going to affect me whether you do or not. He said, then it'd be okay. I said, I don't know, Ray. You've got to make that decision. So he was, okay. And he started leaving. You know, it wasn't real negative, but it wasn't real positive either. I said, um, just before he left, I was, oh, Ray, Ray. I said, you're having difficulty with this, aren't you? Well, yeah. I said, you know something? Next time you go to make a decision, you won't have difficulty. I said, this is a good experience for you. And I said, it'll be easier for you to quit next time. And I said, if you do it often enough, you'll master quitting. He says, oh, God. <laughs> I don't remember, but I don't think he did quit. But anyway, now, I have a daughter, Colleen. And um, I had an uncle that did not treat his daughter, one of them, right. He had three of them, so four of them. The, the oldest one, um, she's 16 or something, she would stay out a little late. He'd lock the door. She wouldn't get in the house. 
And I said, you know, that's not right. He said, oh, don't tell me that. He said, wait till, wait till Colleen's older. You'll find out. I'm thinking, well, geez, I sure hope I'm not going to be like you. Well, he said, wait till she's older. You'll learn. And I'm thinking, I wonder what I will be like. I don't think I'll do that. Well, then one day Colleen come along. She said, Dad, Gary and I were thinking of going away for the weekend. What do you think? And I thought, oh, geez. <laughs> I said, I don't know, Colleen, I don't want to go with, get away for a weekend with Gary. <laughs> well, she said, you must have an opinion. <laughs> I'm thinking, I sure have, but I'm not telling you what it is, <laughs> you know? And I said, well, I, no, I don't. I'll have to ask her. I can't remember whether she did or didn't, but I did not interfere. I have never made decisions for my kids. Because I learned, first of all, I started to study this before Brian was born. And I learned that great lesson from Napoleon Hill. The chapter on decision is incredible. Most people never make, they're going around everywhere, what do you think, what do you think I should do? What do you think I should do? And they're asking people that have no idea. And you'll always get an opinion. It won't cost you anything, so you'll know what it's worth. The only prerequisite to making a decision, you want it. You want to do it. You want to be it. You want to. If we really understand that, when we make the decision, we flip ourselves onto that higher frequency, then we've got to stay there. That's why von Braun said the will to do it. The will is what keeps you on the higher frequency. Yes. And it's by being on that frequency that the attraction starts. Attraction is a secondary law. It's not a primary law. Primary law is vibration. You put yourself in the vibration because of the frequency you're operating on, and you'll attract whatever's on that frequency. Everything that you need will come to you, and in the right time. Don't be impatient. You'll get it when you're supposed to. Everything is in the right place for the right reason at the right time. Now, you get some great ideas this weekend. I don't do all this perfect, but I do it. And I do it to the best of my ability. Now, I know next year I'm going to be better at it than I am this year. But I give it everything I've got. We have a tremendous group of people in this company. They're absolutely incredible. And those of you here last night would know that Robert Pascuzzi and his wife are joining us. They're going to be working with us. And he's going to be in charge of global expansion. I'm looking forward to working with him. Very interesting couple. Big things are going to happen. We have made a decision, and we're on the move. This thing's going to get much bigger and it's going to get much better because it's a habit for us to work that way. That is the way our paradigm is structured. I would suggest you do the same thing. Talk to people that have done it. If you're 23 and you're a female and you're not earning $50,000 every three months, go sit down with Madison. She might not show you how to perform neurosurgery, but she can show you how to earn 50,000 bucks in three months, or 300,000. What the hell am I saying? It was 50 people. Don't leave here without making some kind of a firm decision of what you're going to do. And understand this. You could come back. Phil Goldfein keeps coming to this. You could come back. You wouldn't hear the same thing because you wouldn't be the same person. It's like when you read a good book through the second time, you don't see something in it you didn't see before, you see something in yourself that wasn't there before. It's so important. Repetition. Get a recording. Listen to that recording until it's right sunk deep in your subconscious mind. There was something I neglected to do. 
It won't take long, but I'm going to do it because I said I was going to do it and I didn't do it. I got thinking about people wanting to lose weight. Where is, here he is, okay, wait a minute, I'm going to get Nino Aldi. You got, they've got it set up? Okay, come on up here. I completely left my mind. Hey everybody, uh, my name's Nino Aldi and I'm a, a student of Bob's and I've been doing, uh, I've been studying his material for a long time and I, and I recently uh, met him last uh, Paradigm Shift right before. So a little backstory on myself, I'm a filmmaker um, and I, I, know, I know Phil, I was a field producer for 17 years on The Voice um, until recently just to do my passion which is ultimately to make movies, directing, feature films and ultimately as great as like The Voice had been for me, it, um, it's living someone else's dream, right? So, but you can use the context in all sorts of things. And what I had shown him before when he was, um, you know, when I, when I was over there is when I was a student of his, uh, as I was making these videos, I um, essentially, I took his principles to make a weight loss video because I was really overweight, right? From working on sets a lot, I have just gotten the, uh, the worst shape of my life. And, you know, as a filmmaker, you have to tell a narrative where you can effectively convey a story from beginning to end. So I figured that I was going to um, get in the best shape of my life. Now, again, so I set the goal that he said, which was for me, it was like, I'm going to be a fitness model. And I kind of made an, a decision, just like he's saying, and I put an image on my wall, what I wanted to look like. And then I put, uh, I set up a time lapse situation in my garage and I decided, it took me two weeks to figure out how I was gonna fil uh, film the thing. And then I ultimately just then started to do it. So I didn't even really know what I was going to do, but other than the fact that I did it. And uh, since that moment, a lot of things have happened, but uh, if you play the video, I can show you exactly what I did. This is me essentially, my journey um, from zero to hero by just making a decision. What happened to you? You need to do something about this. I know, but I don't have time. Really? I got kids now. It's not so easy. That's not true. Not my 24 long hours. Too late. When I get stop. a break, I can't afford to stop the next day. Enough! Take it one day at a time. Next week, next month, next year is coming whether you like it or not. Where are you going to be? Now get up. Keep going. You don't have time for the gym? The world is your gym. Gravity, your weights. Anywhere, your treadmill. Creativity, your machine. You've got this. You are your personal trainer. If you can do this, you can accomplish anything you set your mind to. Nothing can stop you now. Nothing. Um, Nina was here a few months back, and the audience loved it. And I was talking to him, so I had him come back. And I don't know how, he completely left my mind. I was going to bring him on right when I started this particular section. And I'm sitting, and all of a sudden it hit me. I never had him come up here. Yeah. You do a good job. Thank you, Bob. Phenomenal job. When I met Nino, he was a producer on The Voice. Phil said, you know, there's a guy that would like to meet you. He's a producer on The Voice. And I said, well, let's meet him. Uh, we were over at the, the Universal Studios, and over at Phil's office. So we went to lunch, and he said, you listen to The Voice. I said, The Voice is about the only thing I do listen to on television. I hardly ever watch TV. And I rarely go to a movie. I'm into this all the time. But I like watching The Voice. I like, it's such an authentic program. It's got nothing to do with what you look like, it's what you sound like, and I think that's pretty cool. We're gonna be jumping around a little bit in the book. It's 